If you don't want to talk to them, then that's your problem. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, welcome, 8 o'clock service. Man, once again, man, that worship, worship to the special. Man, and in that video, I thought to myself, I don't have to preach, man. Everyone's just on fire for the Lord. I'm on fire. I had goosebumps in the back of the, uh, back of the curtains there, man, and it never left. Um, I'm ready to give the word today. Are you ready to receive the word today? Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go ahead and pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit into our hearts right now. Holy Spirit, we come before you. We thank you, Father God, for this beautiful day and this opportunity to draw closer to you. Father, we know that you are moving already. Father, we know that you don't wait for the sermon to start, Father, but you start when we wake up and we open our eyes, Father. We thank you for giving us breath in our lungs and blood in our veins to live another day, Father. May you just use this sermon, Father God, to break chains, to break cycles in the name of Jesus, and may you bring transformation. Lord, we thank you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name we say, amen, amen, hallelujah. Break out of the insanity. Break out of the insanity. We're in the message series of Breakout, and today's message is titled, Break Out of the Insanity. Now, what is insanity? What is insanity? What, what does insanity mean? I'm pretty sure many of us have heard the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different result. We've all heard this definition. And many times if we, you've seen the picture or the quote, uh, it normally has Albert Einstein next to it. It's that Albert Einstein uh, says this quote. Um, um, Fun fact, Albert Einstein was wrongly accredited for this quote. Fun fact, it was actually a woman by the name of Rita Mae Brown. She was a novelist who, who, who said this quote, who had said this definition in one of her books, and Albert Einstein had said it, and he was accredited for this awesome definition. Now, regardless of who said it, the reason I say this is so you can throw out your coffee mugs and t-shirts with the quote on it, because Albert Einstein is not the one who said it. Uh, but regardless of who said it, Regardless of who said that, can we all agree that it makes a valid point? Can we all agree that it makes a valid point to doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result is insanity? We can all agree on that, amen? Are you with me, Hope? Hallelujah. And so, so I thought to myself, what does it mean to break out of the insanity? Why do we need to break out of the insanity? And I believe uh, that many of us uh, we will come with a technicality, right? Mr. Technicality will come along and he'll say, oh, but Austin, um, um, I do the same thing over and over again because uh, it shows my perseverance. Um, um, Austin, I do the same thing over and over again because it shows my consistency. It shows that I believe. It shows that, I, I, that it, it will happen. It will change. Right? That, 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 that's, people will come with that technicality and say these things. Well, I went, I went ahead and I thought to myself, well, what's the real definition of insanity? And this is straight from Webster. And it's in your notes. Insanity is described as this. A severely disordered state of mind usually occurring as a specific disorder. Extreme folly or unreasonableness or something utterly foolish or unreasonable. Now, a lot of definition. But what I, what I take from this definition is not in the right state of mind. Right, doing things that are unreasonable and, and, and utterly foolish. And in, in the courtroom, people will plead uh, insanity. They'll say insanity, and what, what it does, it describes as a person who doesn't know fantasy from reality. It describes insanity as a person who doesn't know right from wrong. So ask yourself this, Mr. Technicality. If you do the same thing over and over again, shows your perseverance, and it's not insane, does that mean that I can eat a Big Mac cheeseburger every day and expect a chiseled body? It shows my perseverance. It shows that I never give up. That I believe if I eat a Big Mac cheeseburger every day for the rest of my life, I'm going to have a chiseled Aquaman 2 type of body. I'm putting a plug in just in case they want to call me. Amen? If, 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 if we have that mentality of, oh, it shows my perseverance, the question is, what are you repeating? What are you doing over and over again? Yes, there is a point with perseverance. There is a point with consistency. But the question is, are you repeating utterly foolish things in your life, expecting blessings from God? 
Are you doing things that are unreasonable and not in the right state of mind, expecting blessings from God? Are we living in that lifestyle of insanity, thinking if I just keep doing it my way, not God's way, but I keep doing it my way, I'm pretty sure it'll work out. Are we living that type of mentality, living that type of life? Well, we need to be careful because it's God's will that will prevail. God's will will prevail in our lives. And today I want to take, talk about breaking out of that mentality, breaking out of the insanity of doing the same things of the world and the same sins over and over again, expecting blessings from God. Are we doing the same things from 2018, expecting the 2019 breakout? It's insane. It doesn't make sense in the mind. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up. You think you can do the same things but expect a, uh, expect a different result? That's insane. That's insanity in itself. So ask yourself, what am I doing? What am I holding on to that's hindering me from my 2019 breakout? And today we're going to talk about breaking out of that insanity. Amen? Amen. Are you with me, New Hope? So we, we talked about what is insanity, and, and, and God gave me this, uh, this vision or this, this illustration of, of us r- riding on our horses into the race, right? God calls life a, a, a race, and God says, saddle up your horse, and let's take on this race. Let's go. But I believe many of us have gone onto the wrong horse. I believe many of us have gone onto the horse of the merry-go-round. Many of us are on the horse of the merry-go-round, and we're just going in circles, and we're, we're on this horse. Like, God, I'm on the horse. I saddle up, God. And, and God is like, I'm over here. Yeah, God, I'll be there. I'll be there. And we're on this horse, and we're going on this merry ground. You're on the wrong horse. And you keep going around circles and circles and circles. And you ever, you ever see someone who's on a merry ground or on a roller coaster, and they're like, they're like this, right? That's why we many times people say, hey, God is good. All the time, all the time. Yeah. Hey, hey. We're, just, we're just going around because we're getting dizzy. We're getting dizzy. We're on this merry ground. We're on the wrong horse. God has called us to saddle up your horse and take on the race. But we get out, we're on this horse, and when God says, hey, walk with me, we start to walk crooked. We start to walk crooked. Think about it. Think about it. It's a little deeper than what you think. Because of the dizziness of life, because of the dizziness of life, we start to rock, walk crooked, a crooked path. And God is saying, walk straight towards me. But because I've been dizzy and I've been going around and around with the world, now my, my path has become crooked. Or well, now I, I can't really see God. He's become blurry. But because I've been going on this merry-go-round, I, I, can't, I can't make out what's right and what's wrong. I can't make out what is fantasy and what's reality. I can't make out what is right and what is wrong. We're living a life of insanity. You're on the wrong horse. Somebody say, I'm tired of this merry-go-round. <laughs> say, I'm tired of this merry-go-round. <laughs> Today, we're going to break out of that insanity. Today, we're going to break out of that insanity. God's going to give us, uh, God's going to teach us a few points, a couple tips that will help us break out of the insanity. And God has taught me a, a lot of things through, the, through, through this message. And he's changed my heart. And I pray and I declare that it will change your heart by the end of this sermon that there will be transformation and there will be chains broken because we're going to break out of the insanity. Hallelujah. You want to break out of the insanity? Number one, dare to be different. Dare to be different? I could dig it. Dare to be different. You see, we live in a world that's become backwards. We live in a world where, where we once lifted up and praised Jesus Christ. But because of the fear of offense, we now hide Jesus. We live in a world where we once praised and glorified God, but now we hide him because of the fear of offense. But yet the world is okay in glorifying the dollar bill. But yet the world is okay at glorifying half-naked women on the TV. The world is, is okay with glorifying these things that are not good for us. The world is okay with glorifying those things. And what, what blows my mind is, is we can never talk about Jesus in the media. Or we can never mention Jesus in the media. But as soon as a celebrity announces that they live in a homosexual lifestyle, they're praised for their bravery. Now, I know I may step in on some toes, but I need to leave the stage with not blood on my hands. I need to speak the truth. We live in a world that's become backwards. We live in a world where everything that was once taboo is now okay. But we, glo- we used to glorify God, but now we hide him. Now maybe you've grown up in this world and you've adapted. You've adapted to these things. 
and you're wondering to myself, I, I, I can't see God. I, I, I'm, God is blurry. Jesus has become blurry to me. Well, today we're going to break out of those habits and we're going to break out of that insanity to bring Jesus back into the clarity of your life. We need to put Jesus back in our lives. Be different. Put Jesus back into your life. You know, a pastor once said that, that with the world being backwards, uh, now the only thing to rebel is to read the Bible. Because that's the only thing we're not doing. To rebel is to read the Bible. That's the only thing we're not doing. We're doing everything else that God says not to do except praising him. And you want to be different, go ahead and read your Bible. Put Jesus back into your life. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, Austin, I've never accepted Jesus into my life. What if I told you that when God knitted you in the womb, that God put traces of Jesus in your heart, that God put traits of Jesus in your heart, that you were created to have Christ's likeness in your heart? But because you've been going on this merry-go-round in life, and you've been going on, you've been adapting to the world, and you've been doing the things of the world, that now you, 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 Jesus has become blurry to you. Jesus has become, uh, th- your life has become crooked. Your walk is now being crooked because you've been going on this merry-go-round. I want to tell you today, it's time to put Jesus back into our hearts. Amen. It's time to be different. The world will just go on and do what it wants. But it's those who will be different who will stand for Christ. You ever been to a water park where they have a lazy river? You know what a lazy river is? It's, it's a big circle where, where people just kind of lounge in the tubes and they just they follow the current. And if you're standing and you, you, you don't have a firm foundation or you don't have a firm stance... You'll be easily caught up in the current and just go with the flow of the world. You'll get caught up in the flow of the world and you'll start to act like the world and do things like the world. But it says here in your notes in Romans 12 too, it says this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. I'm choosing to be different. I'm going to take the high road. I'm not going to take the low road and act like the world and respond like the world. I'm going to break out of the habits and break out of the the, the insanity of doing the same thing like the world. Over and over again expecting these blessings to come. No, I'm going to break out of that insanity. So I'm going to choose to be different. Amen? Now, choosing to be different has its risk. You risk being persecuted by the world. You risk being laughed at by your friends. You risk being judged by your family. You risk being hated by your loved ones. That's what, coming, what, that's what choosing to be different comes with. But God is saying we need to stand firm and stand, stand strong on his word and not go with the flow of life. Choose to be different. Choose to put Jesus back into your life. Amen. Now, there's a woman in the Bible who, who chose to be different. Uh, and with, with these risks, um, that's why I say to dare to be different. You can be different, but when there's risk involved, you need to dare to be different. And there's a woman in the Bible that maybe we're familiar with because we talked about it last week. This woman who bled for 12 years. This woman who, who, who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, Pastor Ken talked about it last Sunday, and Hanalei touched on it on Wednesday. And God put it on my heart to, to, to really just milk and to, to extract the gems from this story on how to dare to be different. You see, this woman, she struggled with this issue of blood, right? And, and it, says, it says here in your notes, I just want to get right into the scripture. It says here in your notes in Mark 5, 26, it says she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. I want you to underline that, many doctors. And over the years... She had spent everything. I want you to circle everything. She had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Now, this story of this woman, God put it on my heart because I believe that we could all relate to. I believe God put it on my heart because we can all relate to this woman. I had you underline many doctors, because if you think about it, 12 long years, in a 12-year span, there's only so many doctors you can see. In a 12-year span, there's so many doctors that you could see. Now, maybe you've gone and you've seen many doctors throughout your life, but you haven't gotten any better. Maybe you've even gotten worse. 
Maybe we've been going from doctor to doctor trying to seek a fill, trying to seek a fill of the void, trying to seek happiness, trying to seek uh, completion, trying to seek wholeness in these other doctors of the world. But it hasn't gotten me better, but it's made me worse. Maybe I've gone bar to bar thinking I can drink my pain away. Maybe I've gone bar to bar thinking I I can drink the the stress and, and I can get away from my wife. Maybe I've gone bar to bar. I've gone doctor to doctor trying to seek that fill, trying to seek that void, trying to do it the world's way. But see, this woman, she knew that she needed a different healing. She knew that she needed a different type of healing. She said it herself, if I could just touch the hem of his robe, I'd be healed. If I could just touch the hem. See, many of us know that we need Jesus, but we refuse to come to church. Many of us know that we need Jesus to change our hearts. But we, we find it so difficult to make, it our way, make our way to Sunday ch- service. This woman knew that she needed a different type of healing. She tried everything she could over the 12-year span. There's only so many doctors. There's only so many bars you could go to. But there's a time where you need to just humble yourself and come to Jesus. Jesus says to come to me. Now, it says that she also spent everything she had. And maybe you could relate here. Maybe you've gone relationship to relationship, sleeping around, giving everything you have, trying to seek a fill. Maybe you've gone relationship, relationship, sleeping around, thinking you'll find happiness. Maybe he's the one. Let me sleep with him. Maybe you've gone relationship to relationship, giving everything, spending everything you have to heal your pain, to heal your loneliness, Maybe you've gone through this. Maybe you could relate to the woman. But once again, she knew that she needed Jesus. We all need Jesus. But it's up to us to be different and to get Jesus and put, back, put Jesus back into your life. To put Jesus as the center of your life. Put Jesus and make him the center of your relationship. Put Jesus and make him the center of your family. Now, it's different. The world may laugh at you. The, more, the world may call you names. The world may persecute you, but the woman knew that she had to take risks. Why? She bled for 12 years. According to the book of Leviticus, if you bled longer than your cycle, you were were considered unclean. You were considered unclean, and everything you touch and everyone you touch was considered unclean. So the woman sees Jesus. She says, I need a healing. I know that Jesus can give me my healing. There was a risk because if she was to touch people, people might just call her names. Like, hey, you're that unclean woman. Hey, you're, that, you're not supposed to be here. People would start persecuting and judging her. Now, she also risked maybe the Pharisees and the Sadducees are watching, and they apprehend her. Hey, hey what, what are you doing, woman? You're not supposed to touch nobody or nothing. You're supposed to be out of here. You're not supposed to touch nobody. She risked the embarrassment of being apprehended in public. She risked all these things. She knew that if she could just touch Jesus, but she knew that there was a risk involved. That people might call her names, that people might judge her, that people might pick on her. People might look at her differently. But that never stopped the woman. The world is going to look at you different. The world is going to call you names. The world is going to try to hush you. But you need to have that drive and that fire. I want to be different. I'm not going to follow the lazy river. I'm not going to follow the world. I'm not going to do what the world does. I'm going to be different. I'm going to have God in my life. I'm going to react and respond like Jesus because there is Christ likeness in me. That's how you be different. It's okay to be different. The world will always judge. The world will always look at, look at us weird. They'll call us names. But you stand firm in Christ and you watch him heal you just like that woman was healed. She risked it all and she said, I just need to touch Jesus. It might be different. You have to break out of that insanity of doing the same things like the world over and over, expecting a blessing. Break out of that insanity. Amen? Amen. You guys received that? That's, that's, just, that's just number one. Right? Number two, break out of the insanity. Don't let your stubbornness steal your tomorrow blessing. Don't let your stubbornness steal your tomorrow blessing. Pride is a wicked mother. 
a mother who gives birth to a child by the name of stubbornness. And this child's stubbornness grows up to be a great thief, a thief that wants to steal your tomorrow blessing. God wants to bless you. It says in his word that he delights in blessing his children. He delights. He wants to bless us. But perhaps our stubbornness is hindering us from taking it to that level. What does pride do? See what the word of God says in Proverbs 16, 8. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Our pride and our stubbornness to change will hinder us from God's blessing and God's best. We struggle with the stubbornness. Why? Because we don't like change. Nobody likes change. Believe me, I know. I, I'm very closed-minded. I'm going to be transparent and share, share with you my life. I'm very, very closed-minded. And when I did this sermon, God spoke to me. and He said, you got to break that closed-mindedness of yours. You need to break out of that closed-mindedness. Why? Because everything was comfortable for me. What worked for me worked for me. Right? I, I can go to a, a restaurant and, and that we've been there before. They know my order because I'm very consistent, perseverance. I show consistency. I, I, I'm, I'm a, if you could describe my taste in food, it's very vanilla, just basic, basic stuff. As a matter of fact, when it comes to ice cream, I like vanilla. <laughs> vanilla is probably the only ice cream I eat. When I want to get a little crazy on Friday nights, I'll get cookies and cream, right? <laughs> but I, I'm very close-mindedness. And God, God taught me that, that my stubbornness to change will hinder me from different blessings that he has for my life. And, and, and he wants to bless us. He wants to bless you. Ask me when. Like tomorrow. When should you break out of the insanity? Ask me when. Like yesterday. God wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. We need to break out of the insanity. Don't let your stubbornness steal your tomorrow blessing. Right? We choose comfort over change. We choose comfort over change. And this is, this is where it's hard to kick old habits. This is where it's hard to kick old habits. Why? Because I'm used to it. That's just how we've always done it. Maybe the, doc, maybe the doctor is speaking to you. And the doc, I remember growing up, right? I remember growing up, um, my mom would take me to the doctors. And, and, and um, the doctor would always say, hey, um, Melanie, uh, your son, um, he's obese. Um, I, thought, I thought she said, I'm a beast, but she said, um, your son is obese and he needs to go on a diet. And, and just hearing those words scarred me. I said, mom, I got to go on a diet? And my, my mom would always whisper, she says, that's just according to the American standard. You're, she said, she said you're, 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 you're okay. Hey, you're, you're okay. But see, this, this, is, this is what happened. Is, 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 is I bought into that lie. I bought into that lie. So every time I went to the doctor and the doctor would pull out the charts and she say, Austin, I need to have a talk with you. Um, you're, you're obese and, and you, need, you need to go on a diet. I said, my mama told me to tell you. <laughs> but I bought into the lie. I bought into the lie. And what, it, what it's done is it, it, it caused me to live in a lifestyle of unhealthy, uh, unhealthiness. Right, I, I've, I've lived a lifestyle of unhealthy. Uh, my family, well, or my Tia Oliveira household, um, with my mom and my siblings, we always overcooked. We, we loved leftovers. We overcooked, but because we overcooked, we would eat with our eyes. We said, oh, there's more food. Let's make another plate. Um, and that was just how we were. And that, 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 um, that brought an unhealthy lifestyle in my life. And now, ever since getting married to my wife, she's very, hey, we, we need to conserve. We need to save. My wife don't believe in leftovers. Uh, um, she'll cook just enough. I have a bunch of uh, Tupperware that I've never used yet. They're, they're still, they're, they're from the wedding gifts. I've never used the Tupperware because we never have leftovers. Um, but it's that, it's, it's kicking the old habits. See, I was always used to overeating. I was always used to, to eating and cooking more than we needed. But God told me I need to kick that old habit. I, I have plans for your health this year. I have plans to prosper you this year. But you need to kick that old habit. You see, many of us, we act like the children of Israel. Remember the children of Israel who walked through the wilderness. 
children of Israel, they would complain and they would complain to God. And God would bless them and they, they, would, they would pray to God, say, God, we need food. And God would bless them. And then they would say, okay, God, forgive us for complaining. And then they would go and sin again, and they would complain to God. And then they would, they would say, God, okay, um, uh, we, we, need a, we need water. And then God would say, okay, here, here's the water. And then they would go and sin again. See, if we're not careful, we get caught up in the insanity of life. It becomes a tradition, and it becomes a pattern. This is the way it's been. This is the way it's been. We pray, we repent, we sin. We pray, we repent, and then we sin. The Israelites got so used to this that it was almost clockwork. That immediately after they were blessed, they would rejoice and then they would sin. Uh If we're not careful, we might just mess up the pattern. We might go pray, repent, sin. Mess up pattern. Sin. Pray, repent. We might just use God just to pray and to repent. Uh If your prayers have more repenting, repenting, and repenting, then you might be sinning a little more and more and more. If you're not careful, the tradition or the pattern, or I'm so used to this is how it's always been. God is saying, change your ways. But my stubborn heart, no, God, I'm, I'm comfortable. I, I, we, this is how we've always done it. This is how my family's always done it. This is the way I was raised. God is saying, change your ways. Maybe the doctor's saying, quit smoking. Oh, but God, I'm, everyone in my family smokes. This is what, it's what we do. We, we like to go, we smoke. And God is saying, change your ways, but I'm stubborn. But God, uh, bless me. God blesses me. Okay, God, forgive me. Let me go smoke. God, please heal me. God, bless me. Thank you. Forgive me. Let me go smoke. If we're not careful, the pattern might get messed up where I just smoke. Hey, God, it's me again. Forgive me. Thanks, God. Oh, smoke. If we're not careful, the traditions and the patterns in life, the stubbornness to change, We'll mess it up and we'll start just living a life full of sin and just using God to repent. We have to get rid of that stubbornness. What does that mean? Be open-minded. Be open to different things. My family, we always overcooked and we always overate. I'm still getting used to it. I'm still, my, my pants feel a little lighter. You know, my wife, she cooks just enough, right? But what I'm saying is we need to break out of that closed-mindedness. That stubbornness will steal our tomorrow blessing. God wants to bless us. Maybe God is saying to you in the spiritual, get rid of that sin, that old sin that you're still doing. You're staying up late watching things on TV. You know there's nothing good on TV at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. This is what you do. You change the habits. You, you counter it. If you're staying up late, get in your word. When you feel the temptation, get in your word. I, what I do is I put my Bible... Right there, next to the nightstand. Why? It always reminds me. Don't be doing what you're not supposed to be doing, Oz. It's getting into the, the good habits. Getting into your word. I remember for some time, it was hard for me to wake up and read the word. I would wake up and I'd check Facebook. So what I would do is I'd put my phone inside my Bible. <laughs> I'd leave it where I just left off. If I, if I got to get my phone, I got to open the Bible. Those are some new habits you want to add to your life. Kick the old habits. Less time on social media, more time in his word. Kick these old habits, amen? But it's that stubbornness that will steal your tomorrow blessing. So get rid of that stubbornness. Hallelujah. Woo. Where we at? Yes. See, the children of Israel, sorry, I went off track. Children of Israel, because they were so stubborn, it says in Deuteronomy 2, uh, 1, 2, it says this, that normally it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, going by way of Mount Seir. Originally, everyone knows that the Israelites wandered for 40 years. But because they they chose not to change their ways, because they were just stubborn. God even said, you are a stubborn and rebellious people. That even if I'm with you for a second, I'm just going to strike you down. God said, I'll destroy you if I'm with you. So I'm going to send my cloud, send my angel with you. God knew that we were a rebellious and stubborn people. God is telling us you're stubborn and you're rebellious. So we need to change that mentality because your tomorrow blessing could turn into next week blessing. And God is like, dude, I want to bless you tomorrow. I want to bless you like today. But because you're so stubborn, your 11-day walk has now turned into a 40-year journey. God has so much for your life that he wants to pour into you right now. But the more we hold on to the stubbornness, God, it was better in Egypt. 
I felt better in Egypt. There was more food in Egypt. It made me feel good. God is like, I'm trying to bless you today. I'm trying to give you your blessing tomorrow. But your 11-day walk is now turning into a 40-year journey because you refuse to change your ways. You refuse to let go of the old sin. You refuse to kick the old habits. I'm trying to bless you like tomorrow. So God wants you to get rid of that stubbornness. Amen? Amen? Woo! All right. Home stretch number three. Want to break out of mentality? Know this, what doesn't make change doesn't make sense. <laughs> what doesn't make change doesn't make sense. I really want to slow down at this point, and I just want to really minister because this is where I want to talk about generational curses. Generational curses. Now, I... I, I me growing up in, in Hawaii, I was born and raised in Hawaii. Growing up, my Sundays consisted of wake up, football, uh, um, drinking, and barbecue. Uh, I'm, I'm half Filipino, so um, my mom's side and all my aunts, they would go in the garage and they'd play cards. They'd play cards, they'd gamble. So that was my Sunday. We'd wake up, football, gamble, uh, uh, food, and beer. That was my Sunday. And because I grew up in this environment... It became normal to me. It became okay. That, that was the norm for me. And as I, as I grew up, and now, now, now that I have a, a wife and I have a son, I, I, I remember sitting back and I'm looking and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, I, I, I watch videos on Facebook from family back home and, and, and stuff like this, and I'm thinking to myself, um, I'm, I'm almost uh, 30 years old, and, and my family's still doing the same things that we were doing when I was like five, six years old. And I thought to myself, man, things never change. And I thought to myself, man, to live that life just wouldn't make sense. Because I see where they, they, they're, they're still in Hawaii. And it's, it's not bashing my family, but I'm looking at I'm saying there, is, there hasn't been a change in the way they live their lives. And I thought to myself, what doesn't make change doesn't make sense. If there's no change in my family... If we're still going around the same mountain together, it just doesn't make sense to me. So there needs to be a change in my life. There needed to be a change in my life. So I remember talking to my wife, and, and, and before my son was born, I said, hey, I don't want my son to grow up thinking that this is the, the norm. So what we do now is, is, is we, we go to family gatherings, we hang out, but as soon as we hear the obnoxious yells and, and, and shouting and, and things start to get crazy, we start to pack it up. We start to pack it up. And it's nothing against my family, but it's, with, it's something against my family. It's something with my family that I don't want my son to grow up thinking that this is the way we should live our lives. I don't want my son to grow up thinking like this is the way daddy and all his uncles and, and everyone, this is how we live our lives. I don't want my son to grow up that. I want my son to grow up in the way of the Lord. I want my son to grow up the righteous way. I want my son to grow up thinking that, hey, there's more to life than just barbecuing and beer. There's more to life than just gambling and beer. There's more to life than that. And we made that choice, and my wife agreed. She said, yes, let's, let's do that. So, so that's what we do. But at the same time, we're planting seeds. We we're planting seeds. And what, what God, God is so cool. God is so amazing that he uses us um, to, to kind of, um, I want to say, uh, 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 calm the fire. But I notice that when we're around certain family members or certain friends, they say, oh, we can't smoke in front of Austin. Oh, I, I can't drink in front of Austin. See, I'm not even intentionally trying to change their life, but God is using my testimony because they know who I am. They know what I do, and they know who I believe I am. And they respect that. And what that does, it causes them to smoke less. It causes them to drink less. It causes them to swear less, to cuss less. I'm not even doing it intentionally, but God is so cool and so amazing that he'll use us. If it doesn't make change, then it doesn't make sense. The story of John the Baptist, I'm going to wrap it up with this story. John the Baptist, um, it says that an angel came, appeared before Zechariah. Zechariah was uh, John the Baptist's father. And he said, hey, uh, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, how is this possible? Zechariah didn't believe him. So the angel said, okay, you're going to be mute. You're not going to speak until the baby's born. So Zechariah, he, he's, he's, he's muted. He can't speak. And his wife, Elizabeth, she becomes pregnant. And, and it says that she had, uh, John the Baptist was in her womb. 
right? And, and this, is, this is where it gets, it, it gets cool. Because at the same time, uh, Mary became impregnated with Jesus. It says here in Luke 144 that when I heard you, your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. This is Elizabeth speaking to Mary. You see, because Mary was like, ooh, I'm about to have a baby. Elizabeth's about to have a baby. Let, let's go. Let's meet at Starbucks and let's go hang out. And, and don't drink coffee when you're pregnant. Oh, so, so Elizabeth and Mary, they meet up. And it says that when Mary's running to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, the baby in her womb, jumped and leaped for joy. And I thought to myself, that's so interesting. And then the story goes on. The story goes on, and it says in Luke 1, 60, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me, let me slow down. So the baby jumped for joy. Now, everyone says, hey, let's name the baby Zechariah. Let's, be, let's name the baby Zechariah. And, and, and Elizabeth, she, she's like, hold on, what are you talking about? Uh, um, she, she says in your notes in Luke 1, 60, but Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? They exclaimed. There is no one in all your family by that name. This is what I took from this. Generational curses. Generational curses. Think about this. They said we should name him Zachariah because there's a Zachariah in your family. And she's like, no, no, his name is John. Um, no, there's nobody in the name, by that name in your family. Maybe God has spoken over your life and says, hey, you are to be a worshiper for me. And maybe the devil has whispered to your ear and says, no, no, no. There's no worshipers in your family. There's no worshipers in your family. Um, um, uh, maybe God says, Austin, uh, you're going to be um, on the worship team and you're going to speak my word. The devil has spoken to me many times and says, Austin, there's no worshipers in your family. Austin, there's no pastors in your family. There's nobody that preaches the word in your family. No, we should name you alcoholic. We should name you alcoholic because there's a long line. Everyone in your family does it. Oh, we should, we should call you domestic abuse. Oh, there's a long line in your family. We should, that's what we should call you. But no, God says, no, 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 no. His name is Austin, my worshiper. But there's, there's, there's no worshipers in the family line. Elizabeth knew who her son was. God knows exactly who you are. God knows exactly who you are, and it's time that you break those generational curses of that's just how my family is. If that's your mentality, you need to kick that mentality. That's just how my family, that's how we've been for years. That's how we've been since I was born. We've always drank. We've always smoked. We've always done these things. That's just how it is. If that's your mentality, you need to kick that mentality. What doesn't make change doesn't make sense. What doesn't make change doesn't make sense. If you're just going around the same mountain over and over again, and you're thinking to yourself, man, wh wh why is my family not prospering? What, why is my, my children not in their word? Why is my wife, uh, um, um, she's not being a submissive. Why is she not speaking the word? And why, why is she not um, sharing the word or, or doing her daily devotions? If you're thinking these things, the change begins with you. The change I want to see must first begin with me. We need to break those generational curses of thinking that's just how my family is. That's just how we always were. No, we need to make that change. Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. God told me his name is John. The world and society will always try to label you. The world and society will try to label you and say, no, that's not your name. There's a long line of, of, of such and such in your family. That's what you are. But God tells you who you, God says who you are. In the word, amen? amen. And the last scripture in Luke 162, it says this. So they gestured to ask, ask the baby's father. Remember, Zechariah couldn't speak. He was mute. What he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. What does this teach us? We don't need a man's approval to tell us who we are. His father couldn't speak. How did he know? I believe that this was Holy Spirit. Remember, when, Mary, when Elizabeth saw Mary, the baby jumped in her womb. When we come face to face with Jesus, I believe that there is a jumping in our spirit. There is a jumping of joy in our spirit where I know who I am. I know who God says I am. I am who God says I am, and I believe it with conviction. That when we come face to face with Jesus, when we come on Sunday service and we're in deep worship and we're face to face with our Savior, there is a spirit in us that jumps for joy. 
And I know who I am in Christ. And I believe it. Zechariah couldn't know that. He couldn't speak. Elizabeth never told him, but it's the Holy Spirit in him and in her. God knows who you are. You don't need man's approval to speak and say who you are. You just listen to the voice of God, and he'll tell you who you are. And you break out of that insanity of that's just how my family is. We're doing the same thing like last year. We're doing the same things of last year, last year. We're doing the same thing as last year, last year, last year. No, we're going to break out of that insanity. What doesn't make change doesn't make sense. In order to do that, we need to kick that stubbornness because that stubbornness will take your tomorrow blessing. A new hope, dare to be different. Choose God. Put God first in everything that you do. Break away from following the world. Break away from copying the world. The world might bash the president. How about pray for your president? Be different. Instead of bashing your boss and your, your coworkers, pray for them. Be different. Now it's going to come with some risks. You may be laughed at. You may be mocked. But God says that he will bless you and he will prosper you in the name of Jesus. Did you all receive that new hope? Hallelujah.